You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your bland host, Abraham. And I am your salty host, Shane. Ooh, where's Psychology Podcast? We talk about the things that people do, why they do them, how they do them, when they do them, what, what they, they do, do them. them. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I was like, there's another WH in there. And so all the psychology things, sometimes we specifically talk about the biological and psychological mixture of things that leads to our overall experience of the world around us, which is what today's topic is going to be about. But if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Thank you for being here. hope you enjoy this episode. If you do, when you get to the end, you might think, that was good. I want more. You probably will hopefully think that. And a way that you can do that is by subscribing. You can leave a rating and review. You know, like us, follow us on social media. You can join us over on Patreon. And if you do that, you get extra perks and benefits. You can also synthesize a bitter chemical and then name it why we do what we do. Or just Uh WWD. WWD would sound very official if you were to name that. Yeah. That's true. I'll explain more all the ways that you can support us when we're done with this discussion today. But this episode will drop on July 12th, 2023, this year. And that falls on a Wednesday, as our episodes tend to do. And so there are some holidays that we'll acknowledge about this July 12th day upon which this episode is released. Yes, we have so, so many days, so many weeks, and so many months. So the first day is Malala Day. Hmm. If you're not familiar with Malala, that is Malala Yousafzai. I'm so sorry if I mispronounce her name. But if you're not familiar with her story, uh, it's pretty incredible. She was shot and survived and has been a female education activist and actually won a Nobel Peace Prize for her work with advancing female education. So a uh, really good day to celebrate because she she's alive and she's well. I realized I said she was shot and didn't say she survived. She's live and well, doing great. Please celebrate her. She's an icon. Oh, that's amazing. I uh, love that. And maybe the opposite direction of that, it is National Simplicity Day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'll keep it, I'll keep it like that. It's no <laughs> explanation needed. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. It's also National Etch-A-Sketch Day. So for those of you who, uh, uh, as we established, we are old millennials. We probably had those around when we were younger. It is National Different Colored Eyes Day, which I, I kind of wish I had different colored eyes. I love that. Yeah, yeah. So celebrate your heterochromia, folks. Yeah. It's also National Pecan Pie Day or Pecan Pie Day, depending on if you're Dolly Parton or not. Dolly Parton says it's pecan because a pecan is a can you pee in, is what she says. But I asked a pecan farmer and he said it's pecan and he said it just like that. So I don't know. Do we do we ignore Dolly Parton? It's a question. That, <laughs> it's a question we have to ask. Do we pee in cans is another question I would ask. Uh, yeah, maybe in Georgia. It is National Tyler Day, not Tyler Durden Day, although that is what popped into my mind first, but National Tyler Day. Yeah, yeah. It's also a celebration of weeks, so it's National Ventriloquism Week, if you like that sort of thing, uh, you spooky, spooky person. <laughs> <laughs> it is Nude Nude Recreation Weekend, which I think is great. I think it's people who are comfortable in their own skin, I'm super happy for you. I love that. That's the thing that you do. <laughs> Go enjoy Nude Recreation Weekend legally, please. Yes. Also, uh, does it really match up with Nude Recreation Weekend? It's National Grilling Month, so please be careful if you're <laughs> grilling during your Nude Recreation Weekend. Yeah, maybe don't combine those ones. <laughs> nope. Otherwise, you might also be recognizing the other holiday, which is Bereaved Parents Awareness Month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be careful. It's also Fragile X Awareness Month. Uh, have you ever worked with somebody with Fragile X? I have. Me too. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it is a very interesting diagnosis, for sure. Yes, yes. Probably one worth unpacking on the show, actually, now that I think about it. Yeah, we're going to add it. We're going to add it to the list. Okay, going on the list. Also, at the end of this list for things that we're celebrating is that it is National Hemp Month. So go out get your hemp. Yes, so, so much hemp. Hemp is actually, like, super cool, if you don't know about it. It's super versatile. So Yeah, it, there's a lot of interesting properties to hemp, maybe also worth another discussion. Although we did talk about the history of cannabis in our episode on how cannabis gets you high. So there was a little bit of talk about hemp in there. Yeah, there's so many topics to unpack. Basically, what we're saying is we're never going to stop talking. <laughs> that is that is the plan. <laughs> Speaking of never stopping talking, this is actually not a, like what we do. We like to list those holidays, but we're not a, a podcast about holidays or day recognition. We're a, a podcast about psychology. And one of the things that humans do is we engage with our world via our sensory organs. And sometimes our sensory organs are particularly sensory. They're like 
the heightened level of super sensory. And that's what we're talking about today. And so I'm going to start this with a quick, a quick story, which is that one time I was visiting this science museum event. It was like some kind of Yelp event or promotion event. I don't know, something like that. And I was given this little thin strip of paper and told to just put it on my tongue and see what I tasted. And depending on my response, I was either based on their description of it, more or less evolved. Hmm. I don't remember my experience, but I was told that I was less evolved <laughs> based on whatever it is that I reported tasting, which I did not appreciate very much. You went to a science museum and you did acid, is what you did. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why you yes. that's why you don't remember it. <laughs> is that why it was called the Timothy Leary Museum? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Just yes, kidding. Yes. So anyway, I don't know if the test that we're talking about today is the same as the test that I took when I was there, but it is for, it's going to be related in some way. This idea of just putting some flavored piece of paper, presumably flavored, on your tongue is a common strategy, not for determining your level of evolution, because that is a stupid nonsense position to take on this. We're all evolved, so we're as evolved as we need to be at the moment. Yes. Instead, it's really a test of whether... Your genetics have created for you a tongue that is sensitive to specific chemicals that not everyone's tongue is sensitive to. Right. And so there's a wide range of taste sensitivities, but those on the high end are called super tasters. As we have already established, Abraham, not one of those. I'm not sure because I've never done acid in a museum, but I would say that my <laughs> tastes are pretty, pretty sensitive. <laughs> I think it depends on what the flavor or the taste is. Right. Like, so okay. I think for me, I'm particularly sensitive to vinegars. So okay. which I can't stand pickles. I do not like pickles. Oh. And uh, and I am like very particular about the mustard that I like. If I like mustard at all. Right. Usually it's a honey mustard. OK. Because it's sweeter. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I have learned about myself is like there are certain tastes that are very particular to me and I and they stand out as like I'm very sensitive to. OK. You may be one of the more sensitive tasters or and maybe not quite in like the category of super taster, although, we'll, as we'll find out, that is a spectrum of flavors. But I'm curious, you listeners, if you think you're a super taster, as I said, I am very confident I am not one. I think I am on the low end of what we'll describe later as a non taster. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have exquisitely poor sense of taste. Okay. Interesting. Which comes with all kinds of other situations. So anyway, that's that's where I'm coming from. But let's actually go ahead and dig in on this because this is both not a long discussion. At the same time, there's kind of a lot to unpack. It's just it's fairly straightforward because it's like this, then this, then this, talking about sort of where this came from, what the research says, where it's gone, the research has gone since its original inception, and what we know about this now, and some implications for this. Because as, as you've sort of heard, you might have, I guess, an assumption about what a super taster is going to prefer in terms of their food and whether or not that dictates exclusively what kind of foods they prefer. So we'll get into all that. Yeah, this should be fun. So here is everything there is to know about this as far as we know. So when COVID was starting to enter the news, one of the characteristic symptoms was that uh, that there was a loss of the sense of smell and taste. So during these early days, the thought was kind of around uh, about the advantage of losing smell and taste and how that might be easier to make healthy eating choices. Eat less, eat healthier food, eat bad food that's probably good for you, like that the bad tasting food, I should say. Right. And those were kind of conversations that were coming up. And you could see those videos of people like drinking different liquids out of straws that were hidden and they would drink like pickle juice and like hot sauce and all kinds of stuff and they wouldn't taste it at all. And it was really bizarre to me. So uh, it was a real strange phenomenon that was occurring for a minute. Yeah. And the time that I got COVID, I did not lose my sense of smell or taste. So I didn't get to play around with this, but some people around me did. And they reported basically that like everything is just like it has texture. Like, you know that it's there, but it doesn't resonate in terms of it having any type of flavor. Although they did report that spiciness, they still felt heat from it. It just didn't taste like anything. It right. was just like a warmth. Which is kind of interesting because we'll get to some tests for for taste sensitivity using warmth a little bit later. But I, I don't know. What, what do you think, Shane? Would you want to get rid of your sense of taste? No, I think it's one of my favorite things in the world. I also um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just a big foodie. So like I, I, you know, what I've learned in the last few years about myself is that my hearing is going. My eyes are starting to diminish, but my sense of taste and touch are are right on board. So like we're, we're all, okay. we're all good on that. So, and my smell, my smell has never really worked that well, but my sense of taste seems is, it seems to be pretty okay. 
Oh, interesting. So that actually is not uncommon for someone who is a super taster to describe themselves as being a foodie. So I do think you're oh, probably God. on that spectrum. Okay. I think I'm on several spectrums, but that works. That one, <laughs> that one's a fine one too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. As I said, I have long felt I have a very weak sense of taste. I am very poor at picking out individual flavors. I can't even readily isolate or identify flavors even when they've been isolated for me. I tend to enjoy bitter flavors a lot. I'm really just I'm not a very picky eater aside from you know, not eating a, a whole class of foods <laughs> via dietary restrictions, such as like meat and cheese and eggs and that sort of thing. Yeah. So aside from not eating those things, that's not, though it's not a taste aversion thing. Like I ate those things before I made a choice to switch away from them. And so when I, when I experience things, I'm really not picky. The only thing I tend to be picky about is a combination of sweet and savor. I tend to not like that combination. Pretty much everything else I'm on board with though. I'm like, let's, let's, let's give it a shot. I will try pretty much anything. Yeah, I think before I was vegetarian, I would eat just about anything too. Like I had no, I had no problems with that. And then once I became vegetarian, I like am more willing to try flavors, but less willing mm -hmm. to try like new things. I guess pickles or like there's not really opportunities. Like right, you, you know, it's like when you're when you eat meat, you're like, I guess I could try sea urchin or eel, and then you can't really do that as a as a vegetarian. Yeah, but you can be like, oh, you've got like an analog for this. I I'm willing to try that. Oh, you have a lobster roll made of hearts of palm. I will absolutely eat that. Sure. So, you know, it's it's one of those things where there's stuff that I wouldn't have eaten that I do now, but it's not really related to taste. It's more related to like opportunity, I guess. That's fair. So in thinking about taste, then it, I think this raises the question because I think in answering the question I asked earlier of whether I could get rid of my sense of taste, I might. I mean, I do enjoy People always say that they like food, and I'm like, that's because you enjoy being alive. <laughs> Most of us enjoy that. I know, yeah, I've never met an alive human that's like, God, I hate food. Yeah. So I'm like, I feel like you're not really saying anything to say that you like food. You may as well also say that you have bones. Both of those things are like <laughs> relatively equal in my mind. Skin is cool. Yeah. But anyway, I have thought about maybe I could get rid of my sense of taste that that would be good because as you're sort of alluding to, there is this, it might be easier to choose to eat less because I wanted to have cravings for anything, right? Nothing. I would never overeat because I would derive no satisfaction from that. And I maybe could choose to eat only the foods that are the healthiest that tasted the worst, but that like it would be salads without dressings and bowls full of kale and like, you know, things where it was very bitter, astringent flavors of things I know are really good for me, but they don't taste good on their own. And so you end up doctoring them up with a whole bunch of chemicals. But obviously f this idea of of taste and smell, it has a biological evolutionary reason to exist. Yeah. And so before we get into that, I would like to share something in poor taste and that would be ads. All right. So we've been talking about the biological evolutionary purpose for taste. And I, you know, this is something I think about a lot is kind of the hardware that humans come with. Right. Mm -hmm. The purpose, the reason why we do these things from like just a genetic standpoint, biological evolutionary standpoint. And, and I've never really thought of taste being one of those things until yeah. this episode. So thank you for that, Abraham. You are welcome. But sensitivity to gustatory experience that is likely to result in consumption of calorically dense foods would have increased the survival of a species that then spent less time consuming non calorically dense foods or non food items. So basically Taste makes it so that you'll eat things that are that are going to keep you alive and avoid eating things like rocks. <laughs> that's ex exactly it. <laughs> and yeah, so that's part of the reason that we prefer things that are very calorically dense is because eating the more calorically dense the thing was that we were eating, the more likely we were going to have energy to store in case we went through food scarcity later on. Thus, most or possibly all animals have a sense of taste for the exact same reason, being able to tell food from non-food items, specifically seeking out foods that have the biggest caloric bang for their buck that is most likely to ensure survival and thriving and that sort of thing. Now, how much taste do you need? It's not a great question because it's a qualitative question asking for a quantitative answer, but we can talk <laughs> about what those tastes that we experience as humans, what those are. Yes. There's five primary kind of known tastes 
that all humans experience, and we have categorized in a certain way. And they're sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. I love umami. Like that earthy, mm-hmm. like mushroomy flavor. Mwah. Oh, yeah. That tongue <laughs> map that indicates the places on the tongue that experience these tastes may well have been a reflexology map because it is completely wrong. Yeah. Like you do not taste salt at the tip of your tongue. You do not taste umami in the back. It is your ent- It's like kind of like your brain, like where people are like, you use 10% of your brain. It's like, no, you use all of it just at different times in different capacities for different reasons. It's just kind of like, we just don't understand any of it. Your tongue is the same way. You use all of it to taste. You just use it in different ways. Yep. Brilliantly said. Important thing is we're getting into super tasters here because you've heard that term and you've probably immediately are conjuring some idea of what super taster means, what that is. An important thing about super tasters is they don't actually taste different flavors. But they might experience those flavors that we do sense more intensely than people who are not super tasters. Right. So on our tongues, we have these things called taste buds, if you're familiar with those, which are composed of 50 to 150 taste receptor cells. The taste buds, okay, there are multiple taste buds that have these, like, you know, this range of receptor cells. Taste buds rest on top of the tongue segments called the fungiform papillae. The more densely packed the papillae, the more likely... The super taster. So one researcher painted or brushed a dark blue food dye onto people's tongues, pressed the colored tongue to a piece of glass, and then took a picture to count the papillae. The blue dye rests on the base of the tongue while the papillae poke out above the dye and thus appear as white or undyed clumps in an image. And this makes the relative density of the papillae fairly easy to count. You can even try this at home by swishing a little food dye in your mouth and placing a small piece of paper with a hole punched out onto your tongue and count the number of papillae in the punched out circle. Then compare it to other people who did the same thing and count the white circle spots to see who has more densely packed taste buds. The average is about 15 to 35 bumps and super tasters have may have upwards of 60 bumps. Yeah, in that little sample. So yeah, the hole punch gives you sort of a controlled window through which to view the sample. And then you can just compare um, different people's tongues based on what you can and can't see from there, how many there are. Now, 50 to 35 is an average. You can have well below that. I would actually expect that mine's like 10, (laughs) you know, like you got like three or four. (laughs) Yeah, maybe there's one. (laughs) Otherwise, just smooth, just smooth. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Abraham's got a smooth tongue. (laughs) <laughs> Which is why he's a podcaster. <laughs> exactly. That's right. But yeah, these super tasters have like just they're super densely packed. All those sensory nerve endings basically are all really densely packed on the tongue. So there's a lot that they can detect. Mm-hmm. Now, interesting sort of backstory here is how did we even find out that this was a thing that people could taste different sensations? Now, the earliest reports of differences in taste ability may have been known in some places around the world for a very long time. But the very first report that indicated that different people may taste the same things differently from one another wasn't published until 1888. So in 1931, a chemist in DuPont named Arthur Fox, this chemist, Arthur Fox, was pouring a white powdered chemical called phenylthiocarbamide. Yep. Hey, look at that. PTC for short. PTC for short. So we're going to say that uh, into a bottle (laughs) when somehow the chemical flew around in the air. He probably dropped or spilled it. And a nearby co-worker started complaining of the bitter taste in the air, but Fox reported not tasting anything. Curious about this, he tested a large number of people, large number in quotes, that is. His words. Yeah, his words, not, not ours. And found that indiscriminate of race, age, or ethnicity, some people tasted bitter and some people tasted nothing, no matter the concentration. So Fox dubbed these groups of people tasters and non-tasters, or taste blind, respectively. Yeah. Basically indicating that some people can taste this, some people can't. And that was just how the, how they sort of shook out in terms of whether or not they fell into one of those two camps. And this established the idea of tasters as having a threshold after which one could definitely taste easily that bitter chemical versus those whose taste is below that threshold and they do not taste anything at all. And again, doesn't matter the dose. They could have enormous quantities of it. It doesn't register as tasting like anything other than a bunch of powder in their mouth, which they probably made them cough a lot. But (laughs) the people who were sensitive to it, they would barely anything and they would taste it immediately. Right. The first article on the observation of this difference specifically was published in 1932 by Fox. In the same year, another team published a follow up linking the ability to taste these unique compounds to specific genes. So already in 1932 and also let's be let's be honest for a second. I feel like a lot of people were really obsessed with genetics 
in 1932. I feel like there's a lot of For stuff sure. going on that people were really kind of like that was a particular thing. So it makes sense that a study came out pretty quickly about genetics and taste since people were obsessed with that stuff. Yeah, you're exactly right. And so that was kind of the state of what we understood is that there was a difference. Some people could taste something, some people couldn't, and that there was also a genetic link between those things. And around 1970s, I want to say 1979, I forgot to write down the exact year, another study that was looking at some taste found that there was these people who then were studying taste on something, and some people were reporting just not tasting anything, and some people were reporting having a really bitter, unpleasant taste. And they, the researchers were kind of like, oh, that's weird, and then just kind of left it at that. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so fun. I love science. So all the way back in 1991, Linda Bartoshik et al. had published their findings from a series of experiments with tasting ability, and in that article coined the term super tasters. So super tasters started in 91, I believe around the same time that Soundgarden was around, and they put out you know songs that had so what Bad Motor Motorfinger and Super Unknown and all that fun stuff. So that, that's what I was looking for. I was looking for the word Super Unknown. Couldn't think of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and retire <laughs> now. I'm sl- I'm sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got it. So <laughs> Barta Shock, Barta Shook, maybe she was publishing this research in 91. She'd obviously been doing the research up to that point, but she was actually still widely recognized as the reason for the growth in research into taste and considered sort of like the propelling figure that was the big catalyst that got the movement happening on this because she did these really clever experiments. And in her experience, they discovered that although people that lacked the genes and taste receptors to experience the better taste chemicals, such as the one that we've listened, we've listed PTC and another one to describe in a minute called prop, although the people who lack the genes and the receptors to taste those, they had a relatively homogenous experience, meaning that they all sort of reported the same thing. They all had about the same levels of intensity of experience of flavors. They all said they didn't taste any bitterness and those those particular flavors. Those was all things that they sort of reported, right? But what they also found was that the people who did have those genes and could taste those, mm-hmm. they actually had a pretty wide variety of sensitivities. So going back to what I was saying, basically what happened was there was a group of people who could taste it and a group of people who couldn't. And they basically were looking at this as like this threshold sensitivity. You either are over the threshold and you can taste it or you're below the threshold and you can't. But what what she actually discovered was if you're over the threshold, that just means that that's the beginning of your level of sensitivity, that you could have a wide range of how intensely you experience these different flavors that are available to people who do have these genes. Right. So the genes that account for this taste are dominant. So if one person has a genes or if one parent has the genes, the child will most likely or almost certainly inherit those genes, but will be mildly more sensitive. If both parents have the super taste of genes, then the child will definitely inherit them and will have the maximum sensitivity to flavors. That's got to be a a nightmare. (laughs) I don't think that my parents are both super tasters, but if they were and having the maximum sensitivity, like that's like turning my amp up to 11. I can't. Yeah, and I think that's kind of how the report goes. The other thing to know about this is that it does tend to affect women more than men, specifically women with a low BMI, as well as people from Asian and South Asian countries. But that is by no means mean that it's restricted to those. Every person from every walk of life seems to have potentially inherited genes to allow them to sort of super taste, if if you will. Yes. I also appreciate super taste as a verb. (laughs) Indeed. What are you doing this week? I'm going to a wine tasting. Oh, I'm going to super taste some wine. Yes. Actually, one (laughs) of the things I found when preparing for this is the just enormous amount of super tasting as it as people relate it to wine. There's like a whole YouTube series of what they called super tasters, which was, I mean, functionally a bunch of. Sommeliers is enormous. The YouTube channel is basically sommeliers who, uh, and it was called super tasters and they would get this wine and they would just absolutely (laughs) verbally harass that wine for like five (laughs) straight minutes. (laughs) And so that, that was sort of a, the whole wine reference uh, was (laughs) definitely highly linked to super tasters. Okay. That got us pretty off track. I think we should let the advertisers have a minute and we're going to regather ourselves and come back with some more information about chemicals. I like it. Let's get back to talking about this chemical that we previously mentioned, phenylthiocarbamide. Mm -hmm. 
shortened to PTC. That's what that's. So we'll, we'll probably stick to PTC, but just to remind you that that's what it is in case you're big into chemistry and want to figure out how that's sorted. Yeah. Yeah. Big fans out there. PTC is, as we said, supposed to be very bitter to someone who has the taste receptors to identify it. And thus, PTC has been commonly used on test strips to determine tasteability and things like that. However, another super bitter chemical more commonly used today is called 69 propylthiouracil. Yep, which is just prop for short. Yeah, we'll call it prop for short, but I have to say... Abraham, thank you for enunciation guides. Yeah, I just wrote this in there, too. <laughs> they didn't come with us. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it's, it's great. So prop has become synonymous with the super taster and sensitivity studies in general. So you're going to see the see the term prop in a lot of these studies. Yeah, so just as a reminder, prop is that super bitter chemical that they put on things for people to taste that they're only going to taste if they have the genes and the, the taste buds to experience it. So prop studies have thus relied primarily upon the fact that bitterness is the most indicative of super tasting. That's sort of the underlying working assumption there is that if you can taste this, you're a super taster, but it only is bitterness is, is what they look at there. And so over the last 30 years, researchers have actually found that super tasting is far more complex than just whether and the extent to which you can taste bitter. Super tasters may experience heightened but ranged sensitivity to all flavors. Bitter, as we've already established, but also they can have increased sensitivity to sweet, sour, salty, and umami, the flavors that we listed previously. Further, super testers may not even have a high sensitivity to bitter, but instead to the other flavors. So they might not register very sensitive on those tests, but register very sensitive to something like sweet and actually really dislike sweet foods like candy or ice cream because that's just way too overwhelming to their their senses. And then finally, super tasters may experience a range of sensitivities where some flavor experiences are very extreme and some are very mild, as I was just sort of explaining in that example. Right. But people at the highest sensitivity will often describe the intensity of prop to the experience of staring directly at the sun or having a broken bone. Like that's Whoa. how intensely they experience those flavors if they are really sensitive to bitter and then they ingest that prop chemical somehow or just put it on their tongue as they're like, wow, this is like the level of intensity and sensation is the level of intensity to breaking a bone in my body. And they're like a 90 to 100 rating on the pain or the like sensitivity scale. So then I would maybe maybe this is like an in episode recommendation. But if you're a super taster, maybe don't eat new products from Doritos that say maximum flavor because that is going to hurt. <laughs> That it might, yeah. And like I say that like in jest, but I, it sounds like if it's like super flavorful, it might be a problem for some of these folks. Yeah. Uh, we'll actually get to that in a little bit here. Um, yeah. Let's talk about that. So in addition to heightened sensitivity to flavors, super tasters also have increased oral somatic sensation, which is the general awareness and sensitivity to texture or mouthfeel in our mouths, as well as retronasal olfaction, which is the detection of smells as they emanate from the mouth as we consume foods and drinks. And that is essentially to say super tasters are likely to be broadly sensitive to a variety of, but not necessarily all flavors, and they're be more sensitive to textures and how foods smell while consuming them. So I want to kind of stop here for a second and talk about when I was working at Starbucks, one of the things they make you do is taste all the coffee to like, you mentioned sommeliers. Mm -hmm. A lot of people at Starbucks kind of are taught to be kind of rookie or like Bush League sommeliers when it comes to coffee. Yeah. Like you're supposed to taste and like notice notes of cinnamon and earthiness. And like you, they talk about all these things, mouthfeel. They talk about notes. You're going to hear notes a lot when people do tasting. So the <laughs> notes of True. oak. It's like, I don't want to drink oak in my coffee, but it is one of those things. So when you bring up mouthfeel, it's like that makes sense. If somebody's sensitive in one part of their mouth, they're probably sensitive in all parts of their mouth. And that's the thing that they just sort of discovered is it wasn't just the flavors. It was the overall eating experience right. that has multiple dimensions to it that we don't always think about and that these super tasters have a heightened sensitivity toward, which is, is kind of interesting. Yeah. Now... Initially, when they're looking at genetics, they favored only this TAS2R38 gene for super tasting. Love that droid. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> the recent research has found that this really can't account for all super tasting because of a couple things. One is that that gene is only related to bitterness, but it's not related to other flavors. And in addition to that, that gene does not account for mouth sensation or the retronasal olfactory or the nasal sensations that we were just describing. So although that gene is going to be related to this in some way, it doesn't help. It cannot fully account for super tasters. 
Right. So the TAS2R38, or in some references shortened to T2R38. Skip the AS. Yeah, skip the AS. I mean, again, if we're trying to make it a Star Wars character, it's got to be shorter than that. We really only need four letters and numbers. So That's right. It only means that you have the capacity to taste bitter from certain sources, but does not indicate how sensitive to bitter you will be or whether you're more or less sensitive to other flavors or sensations. And that is going to be determined by other aspects of our tongues, our culture, and our brain. So there's a psychology part for you. <laughs> and we're kind of getting into it. And the other thing to think about then is like, how else might we measure super tasters like and and this heightened sensitivity to taste usually in inches <laughs> that's right just stick a ruler on your tongue <laughs> because the test that most people have relied on and as the most widely disseminated only measures bitter flavor but there might be other ways that we can try and measure this hayes and keist in 2011 in the journal physiological physiology and behavior enumerated two other techniques that may help move food science and research on taste sort of forward by measuring other dimensions of it. And first that they mention is something called the irritant bitter tasting or IBT. And IBT has shown that people report bitter flavors and flavors that are not generally considered bitter when they're super tasters. So they might taste spiciness and report sort of a bitter sort of aspect to it or ginger or pepper is something like pepper like flavors or is where they might also report it they might also have a greater sensitivity to non bitter flavors and have a greater flavor sensation in a larger proportion of their tongue meaning that where the taste buds are aggregated cover more surface area of the tongue than they might in someone who doesn't have this sensitivity to food and that would be something that would be detected by the irritant bitter tasting that's super interesting. I mean, you know, as I'm thinking about this too, I'm thinking like if somebody is like a super taster and and so many flavors are, are are like aversive, I wonder if there is some sort of relation with like rapid eating, like fast eating. Mm. Like it's so aversive, like they know they have to eat and they don't want to be in their social constructs, but like they eat, but they eat quickly. They don't chew their food entirely because they want to get it out of their mouth really rapidly. I'd be interested in seeing that. Do you eat really quickly? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay. I do too. And mine is actually kind of the opposite. It's because like I tend to take really big bites because I'm trying to get as much flavor as I can. <laughs> and I, sure. and so I feel like I don't get very much flavor from small quantities. It's got to be like, nope, cram as much as I can fit into my mouth because otherwise I'm just not like I'm going to get just a mild dose of flavor and I'm really trying to get a good punchy flavor. So I yeah. I think <laughs> that that's been my experience with it. And so then I tend to eat really quickly mostly because I'm just taking large mouthfuls at a time. Well, and for me it was I ate quickly because that meant that I could get seconds and because we never had a lot of food in the house it was like okay, so if I ate quickly I was the first one to be able to get seconds. So and I was also the largest person in my house for like for a long time. These are fair points. Yeah, yeah. Now, the second test that we're talking about when it comes to this taste testing stuff is thermal tasting, which is alternating simply heating and cooling the tongue at particular intervals. Super tasters specifically report a phantom taste when experiencing these temperature changes. And they also report a heightened experience of mouth sensations and retronasal olfaction sensitivity during these tests. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's just sort of like warm your tongue and then cool your tongue. And they're like, oh, that tastes kind of sweet. And like, you didn't actually put any flavor there. Yeah. How'd you do that? Yeah, yeah. It seems like people who are not super tasters don't have that same reaction to hot and cold. It's just hot and cold. This seems to get us another way. Now, that being said, neither of these two methods have become mainstream or have been adopted widely into research. And they also aren't a direct measure of things like sweetness or saltiness or sourness or the umami flavor. So it's difficult to tell or really get a good measure on the extent to which someone might be sensitive to those flavors. So they are tests. It's good that we're getting some varieties that we have more more sensitive measures, but hopefully the research will continue to move forward so that we can have better and more robust ways of getting to that aspect of it. Absolutely. So the authors of these studies go on to suggest that we should stop calling it super tasting and instead call it hyperguasia, hypergasia. I was kind of reading it as hypergesia or hypergasia, maybe. I'm not entirely sure. It's, we'll go and spell it for our audience. It's H-Y-P-E-R. And then the hard part here is G-U-E-S-I-A. And apparently this is influenced by Greek. Yes. They recommend calling it, we'll call it hypergasia, because of the association between super tasting and bitterness and the intru- intuitiveness of the name to food and taste scientists. Now, here's what I'm going to say about that. Not nearly as fun. 
Not a fun word. <laughs> Super taster, way it's cooler. Not- so, sci- like, this is the thing about scientists. I don't know. Like, I'm just going to go on a... I'm going to get on a soapbox for a second. Scientists okay. are such bad disseminators sometimes because they're going, you know what they should actually do? They should actually call it hypergesia. And it's like, nobody says that. That's not like a normal phrase or term that anybody says in the real world ever. But super taster is something that people can understand and relate to and, like, pick up pretty quickly because it's more common language. So... Scientists, if you're a scientist, use plain language. Come on. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to step off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, that's that's very fair. I, <laughs> and I actually had a similar thought. And I was like, I mean, maybe in like scientific communication, but I mean, as far as communicating to the public, super taster is a way better term. Yeah. It is way more intuitive. Yes. Like people are going to hear it and immediately have some idea of what that could possibly mean. But if you tell them hy- hypergesia or uh, hypergesia or you, however you pronounce it, they're going to think it's some, you know, STD or something. So, uh huh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is there a treatment for that? No, there's not. <laughs> Put some cream on it. You just, you just hate vinegar. <laughs> All right. There's some more to understand about sort of taste. And I think this is getting into now the discussion about how this relates to things like food preference to an extent. And so... One important piece of this we haven't really talked about much, we've sort of only alluded to, is how is taste in the brain and how taste is processed in the brain is something that's actually really poorly understood because the tongue will do some of the work. There's some mechanical interaction that goes on there, but that's got to get a signal to our brain so that it means something, right? And so that we can respond to it and have some develop some kind of history with it. And that's just not something that there is a lot of research that has been done to help illuminate so far. And what's more is how someone's super tasting ability might affect their food preferences is also something that's kind of poorly understood. On the one hand, super tasters are often too sensitive to sweet, sweet food, spicy food, cigarettes, and alcohol to consume them at all. Like, Mm -hmm. there's actually a very common thing that super tasters won't drink alcohol and they won't eat candy. They won't, they'll avoid spicy food and they often won't smoke because of the intensity of the, of those experiences with those flavors. And instead they might prefer bland, low complexity meals that are very simple, have very little going on because otherwise the flavors might be just too overstimulating and too overwhelming. And it's just like a very unpleasant experience, like having music that's just way too loud and you're like, turn it down. Like I like loud music, but just this needs to come down a few notches so that I can tolerate it. Yeah. That being said, some super tasters, even those that are really sensitive to bitter and spicy and other flavors, they love bitter flavors. There was one I was reading about who was a super taster who loved dark leafy greens, black coffee with no sugar or cream, grapefruit, and all sorts of things that would generally be in the category of things that are you would expect them to not like if they were sensitive to them. And alternatively, some non-tasters might be very picky about flavors that they like or enjoy. Again, it's a spectrum. So I think the important thing here, I'm going to add a caveat to this, that people will hear this and want to justify their idiosyncratic preferences and dislikes because they are super tasters. They'll say like, oh, I'm a super taster. I don't like this and whatever. Or they might think they are. They or they think they are, right? But as we've said and kind of established, being a super taster does not mean that you will hate all of the flavors you are sensitive to. For one thing, growing up around cuisine that heavily features bitter and spicy flavors may make you more, make those more preferred, even if one is highly sensitive to them. Similarly, Some people may be super tasters and hate the texture of mushrooms, or they may love it. Uh, It depends on how it's framed for you and your development. And I would be cautious about avoiding trying new things just because it's new. Give them a try. See if you develop a taste for things. Personally, I didn't like coffee the first time I tried it. I didn't didn't start drinking coffee until I was like 21. Yeah. Similar. And now I'm obsessed. <laughs> and it's it's a real problem. I don't drink it black, but I definitely drink it every single day and large quantities of it. Like, I don't know how I don't have a kidney stone from it. <laughs> and I think both of us agree as part of, like, the culture of why we do what we do. We would work for coffee. Yeah. Pay me in coffee. So, listeners, if you work at a roaster and you want to send us something that we can, you know, highlight on the show, please do. Because we are all about that. You want to do the experiment where I press a lever a bunch of times and I get like chocolate covered coffee beans. I will work for a long time. Yeah. Hours. Yeah. Or just a cup of coffee. And yeah, I drink mine black, no cream, no sugar. Um, I kind of like intensely bitter flavors. As I said, part of it has to do with my, I think, low sensitivity to these things. I also tend to prefer highly spicy foods. Um, and I think it's probably I a similar too. thing. It's like. I get flavor out of things where I'm otherwise just not getting that much versus someone who is very intense 
and may want things bland. So we've said all of those things, but again, the important thing here is understanding that like food preference is so much more complex to whether or not you're sensitive to it. It has a lot to do with your initial experiences with those foods, how you're raised, the culture you're in, the value that's attached to those things, how it's prepared, like a lot of our food preferences are shaped by even just our first exposure to it. Was it a good or bad experience with this food? And thereafter, will you hate it or and, and avoid it or will you try it again? And also, like if we ever got sick eating a particular food, that might drive us away from ever eating that food again. Even if that food had nothing to do with us getting sick, we might avoid it. And like the very first time I tried artichokes, I had some bad experience with it and I wouldn't eat artichokes for years afterward. And it, it took me a while and I'm back to loving artichokes, but it was like a thing where I said, like, I don't like artichokes. And it was just because I refused to eat them because I had that one bad experience. Right. So some people may present as picky eaters because they're super tasters, but being a super taster does not mean you will be a picky eater. So just I want to make sure that's really clear. Some people who are picky eaters because they're super tasters, but being a super taster does not make you a picky eater. You might be that way, but not necessarily. And further, being a non-taster might also make you a not picky eater. It's the case for me. I'm a not, not picky eater who's a non-taster. But being a non-taster does not mean you're open-minded to food variety. Sure. You might be a non-taster and be a very picky eater. And so... The pickiness, the choosiness of your food and your relative preferences that are sort of on extreme sometimes, extreme avoidance or extreme allocation toward and like real rigidity around food is a psychological aspect that is only influenced by our sensitivity to those flavors, not dictated by them. Yes, 100%. I love it. It's kind of my take on point, I think, actually. I, I mean, think I that think kind that of summarizes is the, my... <laughs> the take on yeah. point. Yeah, like, uh, you know, I've heard people talk about like, the, the term picky eaters being like kind of a, a whole like there's a lot of debate around it because it's like, you know, people do have food sensitivities and stuff like that. But it is more than just taste. It's texture. It's amount. It's right. running history. Yeah. It's all those things. Yep. And so it is really important to understand that food in itself is a com like humans have a complex relationship with food because we need it. We don't always like it. We have different preferences and we have unique learning histories. Yes. We can't ignore all those things for the sake of like, oh, I like bitter or I don't. You know, I think I think ignoring that would be a disservice to understanding human like human behavior and human evolution. Hundred percent. Yes. That was great. I also appreciate rephrasing it to take away the I think, you know, picky eater is kind of a loaded term. It implies a certain level of judgment. And I think the in in service of avoiding that, just understanding instead or phrasing it maybe a little bit differently instead is as people who are selective about what they will will and won't eat or to the extent to which they will and won't try new things. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, let's be unselective about our commercialism, about our capitalism, and, and allow these ads to happen, and we'll be back with some recommendations. Ha <laughs> ha! Yes! Okay, if you're joining us for the first time, something we do at the end of these discussions is we recommend some things that have brought us joy in life, and we think they might bring you joy if they haven't already as well. Or maybe you like think to go re-familiarize with yourself with something that we are saying because you you maybe forgot about it, or, or maybe it's brand new to you. Who knows? Anyway, before we get to that, I'd like to just tell you that if you like the show today and you'd like to support us, as I said, leave a rating and review, subscribe, join us over on Patreon. If you do that, you get some access access to behind the scenes stuff. You get videos, you get notes, you get unedited episodes, you get communications from us. And if we get enough people on there, we're shooting for 15 patron supporters, then we'll do a live hangout with y'all or virtual, I mean a virtual hangout, but you know what I mean? Uh, in person sure. or not even in person, a virtual hangout <laughs> that is happening in real time uh, with us. We'll do a Q and a and all kinds of fun stuff like that. And so join us over on Patreon and the people who've already done that. We do. We just so appreciate because of their generosity and their contribution to us over time is Mike M, Megan, Layla, Mike T, Justin, Kim, Joshua, The Daily BA, Brad, Stephanie, Olivia, and Brian. Thank you all so much for your continued support of all the things that we do. In addition to supporting us, you can go over to our website, pick up some merch. If you want to wear some Why We Do What We Do stuff, and we've got things that don't just say Why We Do What We Do or have our logo. There, there are other fun, quippy things. So just go check it out. Maybe you'll see something you like 
for a gift, <laughs> a gift for National Simplicity Day or or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or just like just it's just a gift because you love the people that are around you. Yeah, yeah, or that sort of thing. Anything else that I'm missing? Oh, actually, no, there is something that I'm missing, which is that I should just thank my team, the people who are here that help this be a reality. I'd like to thank our fact-checking and writing by Shane, Jess, and myself, music and editing and production by Justin Greenhouse. Our social media coordinator is Emma Wilson. So just thank you to my team. You guys are amazing and wonderful and appreciate you all as well. And thank you for recording with me today, Shane. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you everyone for listening, but we're not quite done yet. Let's get to those recommendations. Recommendations. So it's very rare that I sit down and take time to watch a movie that I've missed. I have a list of movies that I want to see and I just don't, I don't like I don't actively make time to do this. Recently, I watched two movies. I watched Glass Onion, which was really fun. Mm, yeah. So that's like an, a recommendation within a recommendation. Go watch Glass Onion. Hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I just watched Kingsman The Secret Service yesterday. And what a great movie. Have you seen this? Yes, I have seen all of the Kingsman movies. I am a big fan. Excellent. So if you're not familiar, Kingsman is based on like a spy, uh, like a secret spy organization. It's very James Bondy where like, you know, it's kind of everything's hidden underground, but it's got kind of a more modern bent to it. And there's like some really great comedy in it. But it's really, you know, it's marketed as a spy action comedy, but it's really more spy action with like some really good jokes in it. (laughs) Yeah, there's not a lot of jokes in it, but it stars Taron Egerton, who is incredible. Yeah, everything I've ever seen him in, and he's great in. And uh, Colin Firth, who is also really, really great. Yeah, absolutely. And the cast is really great. You got Mark Strong, Michael Caine. Yeah, I mean, just like it's rounded out with like really cool people. So Samuel L. Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson is the villain, and he and he makes Mark Hamill's real... in there for a second. Yeah, Mark Hamill's. In, yeah, it's like it, but it's uh, it's it's really great. It's just a lot of fun to sit down and watch. It doesn't require a lot of thought, but it does require a lot of just kind of like enjoying it so uh a strong recommendation for me on this i can't wait to watch the next ones that's awesome not to spoil anything for you the first one that you just mentioned is my favorite of the three hands down and i think that my preference for them is matched by the order in which they are released okay so all right that's fair (laughs) yeah so anyway the first one very good i can't remember if i read the graphic novel upon which that is based but i think i have it so i'll get around to it someday and it's mark millar so if you're familiar with his work he did kick ass and he did um a book a comic book called nemesis which is like if batman were a, a serial killer i mean he's got like a really interesting storytelling so sometimes batman is a serial killer that is so, i thing. mean he is he is yeah you're right I'm recommending a video game. I'm recommending Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. This has been out (laughs) for a while, so this is not like super new, but I'm kind of new to it, or at least, you know, maybe a month I've been into it now. And man, just what an absolutely fantastic game. Now, I the last Zelda game that I played was Ocarina of Time. So um, (laughs) there's been at least two or three since that, including Breath of the Wild. I think there's been... Maybe even more than that. <laughs> I think there's probably yeah. been like 10 since then. Okay, there's been a lot. Uh, so I'm I'm way out of touch with this entire universe, but um, I have just been absolutely loving this game. It's just fantastic. I have so few complaints or notes about any of it. It's just, it's just a really, really well done game. So if you're interested in big open box RPGs that will go on forever and ever and ever as you do side quest after side quest, like become a journalist and chase chickens and do all kinds of <laughs> weird stuff that you wouldn't think you would be doing uh-huh. in, a, in a show like that or a game like this, then this is the game for you. I know it's available on, on uh, Nintendo Switch. I don't know if it's available on other platforms. I kind of don't think it is. No, it's not. Okay, then yeah, just Nintendo Switch. So yeah, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Big support of that. It looks incredible. The building mechanic, everybody seems to be having a lot of fun with that. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> that was a really, <laughs> they do such a good job just totally shaking up sort of what we even think of that games can and should be sometimes. Yeah. That was a very unique add to uh, to that game. Yeah, because he's not. It's Zelda's not known for technology. It's known for like medieval magic and shit. So yeah, yeah, basically. All right, perfect. Well, that's all we have to say about uh, Kingsman and Zelda, um, as well as Super Tasters. If you'd like to tell us about Super Tasters, anything that that we missed, or you'd like to add, or tell us your story about Super Tasting and maybe how that has influenced your preferences for food, we're happy to hear that. You can email us directly at info at www.wwdpodcast.com. You can also reach out to us on all the social media platforms. 
not all of them, all the reasonable social media platforms. Yeah. <laughs> so Facebook, Instagram, those kinds of places. Not on Twitter anymore. Abandoned that that ship when it went down. <laughs> That's true. Into the depths of, of darkness. It was a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> but other other places you can find us and we'll be there. Anything else that I'm missing before we wrap this up, Shane? No, I think that covers it. All right, perfect. Then this is Abraham. And this is Shane. We're out. See ya. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.podcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day.